All right, hi everybody. Uh, today we're going to be covering section 7.5, uh, which is known as uh, strategies for integration. Now, on here on the screen, you'll see a table of integration formulas. And this table of integration formulas comes directly from your book. All right, so if you have the book, you can follow along with the book. Uh, and these are the integrations, uh, the integrals that we're going to need for uh, the remainder of the course. All right, so on here you'll see some of the regular ones, like you'll see the power rule, the e to the x, any trigonometric differentiation or integration that we need, uh, integral of secant, integral of tangent, uh, so on and so forth. Now, if the integral appears on this table, so on numbers one through 20, I will not ask you to prove that during an exam. Instead, what we want to do is we want to directly use the result. So anytime that I see that I'm trying to integrate cotangent of x, I need to know that that's going to be equal to the natural log of the absolute value of sine of x. Anytime that I integrate uh, cosecant squared, I need to know that the result is negative cotangent of x. All right. Now, with these techniques of integration, there comes a few results that we have to make sure that we are well aware of. All right. So we're going to start this with saying that we want to evaluate these integrals. And the first integral that I want to evaluate is the integral from 0 to 1 for x divided by 2x plus 1 to the power of 3, and this is all dx. Now I want to make sure that I can solve this specific integral. All right. Now for the strategies of integration, uh, we're first going to go ahead and we're going to try to classify the integral first. What type of integral do we see? Uh, what type of uh, outcomes can we try to anticipate? And uh, what is the method that we'd like to approach? Okay, so I typically go through trig. Is there any trig values that we can see? Or is there any trig substitutions that can take place? All right, looking at this, I don't see any trig substitutions that can take place which means I don't want to use trig substitution. Then I say, okay, well, since we're looking at a rational function, in other words, we have some polynomial up here divided by some polynomial, I want to check, can I use partial fraction decomposition? Sure, I can use partial fraction decomposition here to try to break this apart, okay? Now, will that help me? Well, only time will tell, all right? so. Next thing I can say, well, back in my disposal, I have some u substitutions or some, let's say, integration by parts, right? Now, at this point in time, dissecting all of that, I want to say that I kind of want to go with a u substitution. Now, my, whoops, excuse me. Now, my initial thought as to why I want to use a u substitution first uh, is because I'm looking at the numerator and denominator and they both share some sort of x value. So I'm going to say that u is equal to 2x plus 1, which means that du will be 2 dx. Now you might say, hey, Mr. Castro, I think you might have done this wrong because that dx doesn't have this x value that's in the numerator. And you'd be absolutely correct. However, there's one important aspect here that I can also use. I can also use the fact that if I solve for x, if I solve for x, then what I'm left with is u minus 1 divided by 2, which means on my integral, I'm going to have my x value, I'm going to have my x value to be u minus 1 over 2, 
the denominator that was my u value, so that's u cubed, and then my dx, that's one half du, just like this. Limits of integration. Let's look at those limits of integration really quick. When x is equal to zero, let me go back here, there we go. When x is equal to zero, we get that u is one. When x is equal to one, we get that our substitution turns out to be three. Nice. So let's go through and let's uh, rearrange this and make this look, look a little bit more neat. So this is going to be one, limits of integration are from one to three. I have a half here and also have another half right here. So that's going to be one fourth. All right, and this is u minus one divided by u to the power of three, and this is all du. Now that's pretty good. This is where we wanna be. Now you might say, hey, uh, we have this rational function. Uh, we could possibly use partial fractions. And again, you're right, you can do partial fractions, but at the end of the day, let's check this out. If we can just use algebra. If we can just use algebra, to simplify, because we only have a binomial in the denominator, that means we can simplify this a little bit further, just like this, which means we can integrate this quite nicely. This is uh, u to the power of negative two minus u to the power of negative three, and this is all du. Now from here, it just turns into a direct integral, and we can go through and figure this out. Oops, limits of integration, one to three. So here we go, integrate this. So we're gonna add one to the exponent divided by uh, that new exponent. So that's going to be negative one over u divided by the new exponent If once we add one. So it's gonna be negative three plus one, that's negative two. So divide by that. That's going to be positive one over two one divided by two to the power, uh, two times u to the power of two, and this is all evaluated from one to three. After this, we just do a direct evaluation, and we should get, I'm gonna put dot, dot, dot here so you guys can attempt it, and what we get is one over 18. And this is our final result. So when we're taking this approach for these um, integration techniques, again, we have to make sure that when we go about it, we're using everything at our disposal. All right, now for this one, all we did is we just used uh, integration table one or uh, number one on the integration table formula. All right, let's work with part B. Part B, here we're gonna have the integral of cosine of one over x divided by x cubed. And that's going to be dx. All right, so now we have to go through and figure out what type of method are we gonna use for this? And not only what type of method, but how we're gonna go uh, through that method and actually solve or simplify this integral. So again, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look for any trigonometric substitutions. Always go through any trigonometric substitutions. If you can find them, great. If not, well, that's okay, and you just move on from there. All right, so as I'm looking at this, I don't see any uh, trigonometric substitutions that I want, so I'm gonna keep it as is. All right, next, I'm gonna to try to break this apart. All right, try to make a u substitution and see if that u substitution will then um, help us work through what we need. All right, so let's see. Can a u substitution work here? Let's give it a shot. u is equal to one over x. And as you're gonna come to find out, uh, my method of approach is always trig substitution or uh, a u substitution. If I can do a u substitution, great. I'm gonna try to figure that out. 
So I see u is 1 over x. That means if I work with du, du is going to be negative 1 over x squared, and that's dx. All right. Yeah, I could kind of see something here. Now, it's not as nice, but it's okay so far. All right, let's see. Why is this okay? Well, I have 1 over x squared dx, and I see a 1 over x. So that kind of makes me feel kind of okay. And the reason I say it makes me feel kind of okay is because of this. These two integrals, the denominator is just x cubed. On the right hand side, what I did is I split that x cubed into x and x squared. So by me breaking this apart, I can now go through the u substitution to see what's going to happen uh, with that u substitution. All right, so let's go along with the u substitution then. Now, I'm going to rewrite this just a little bit differently. Just like this. Now, my u substitution is then saying u is that 1 over x. So anywhere I see 1 over x, I naturally insert a u. Just like that. Now, my differential here, dx, dx is one half over, sorry, one over x squared dx, that's one over x squared dx, that's going to be negative du. So in here, I'm going to type in negative du. There we are. Which then means that we're looking at this integral here, which is uh, negative integral of u times cosine of u du. Awesome. So we're at this point in time now. Now is when we can say, okay, well, this kind of looks interesting. I can no longer do a u substitution here because I only have a single variable. There's no exponents. There's no addition or subtraction to separate different terms. And I do have a trigonometric function. That's kind of hinting me to maybe try by parts at this point in time. So my u substitution was only taking place here. So that was my u sub. I kind of want to now try by parts. So let's try by parts. So I'm going to use by parts. Uh, now, since I already used u and I haven't used v, I can go with a, a different variable. So I'm going to say t uh, would be a good one. So let's say t is equal to u. That means that du, oh, excuse me. That means that dt is equal to du. All right, if that was u, then cosine of u cosine of u du is going to be my dv, which means v is just going to be sine of u. Nice. So now all we do is our by parts. Using by parts, remember we have a negative out here. So I'm going to keep that negative out in the front u times v, or in this case t times v, that's going to be u times sine of u minus the integral of v, in this case uh, dt, so it's going to be sine of u, sine of u, and that's du. There we are. Perfect. All right, so all we need to do at this point in time is uh, solve. All right, let's go through it. Or excuse me. Yeah, no, we're good. All right, perfect. So let's go through and let's solve this. Equals negative. That's u 
sine u, the integral of sine of u, that's going to be cosine, but cosine uh, to take that derivative must have been negative in order for this to be negative, or sorry, uh, must have been positive. So that's going to be plus cosine of u, perfect. And then don't forget your plus c. Nice. Now all we have to do is distribute the negative while making our substitutions back in. So again, I'm not trying to solve the initial integral for u, I'm trying to solve it for, for x. So I need to put everything back in terms of x. So I'm going to distribute everything while putting everything in terms of x. So it's going to be negative u, u was 1 over x, multiplied by sine of u, which was 1 over x, plus or sorry, distribute the minus, my apologies, distribute the minus, that's a negative. So it's gonna be minus, and that's gonna be cosine of one over x plus my constant. And there we have it. So for these strategies of integration, yes, these strategies of integration can be very time consuming. Uh, but at the same time, you have to sit back and you have to think about the full aspect. What is it asking me to do? How am I going to do this? And with what methods or what approach do I need to take to make sure that we get to that result? All right, perfect. So that was part B. Let's go with part C now. So part C. What I want here for part C is I want to evaluate the integral of the natural log of 1 plus x squared, and that's going to be dx. All right, so let's look at this integral. Now, I'm trying to observe here, could there be a u substitution? Uh, could there be a trig substitution? Anything like that. I don't see any fractions, so it's not rational. I don't see any trig substitutions, so I kind of want to stay away from trig. I do see that we have function composition. Because we have function composition, we probably want to use by parts. And again, function composition is just when you have this one function embedded in another. So my strategy here is going to be by parts. So if we use by parts, let's see if we can uh, break this down a little bit. All right, so I'm going to choose my u to be, let's say this whole integrand natural log of one plus x squared. And the reason I chose u to be the whole integrand is because there, uh, there's only really one function and that's the only function that I have there. I could have chosen this to be my dv, but then I would have to integrate it. And again, we'd be at the exact same spot trying to figure out what is that antiderivative. So uh, let's work with du. du. Uh, this is going to mean that natural log, that derivative is 1 plus x squared. Chain rule, we're going to multiply by 2x, all right, the derivative of the inside, that's dv. Let's uh, clean that up just a little bit more. That's du is equal to 2x over 1 plus x squared dx. Now my dv dv is just dx, which would mean that the v variable is just x. So let's work with by parts. Here we go. Using by parts, I got u times v. So that's going to be x times the natural log of 1 plus x squared minus the integral of v du. So the integral of uh, v du, that's then going to be this times this. So that's going to be 2x squared divided by 1 plus x squared dx. Now, this is where we want to be at, specifically because 
I want you to take a look at the integrand. Taking a look at the integrand, that denominator should stand out like a sore thumb. That denominator should kind of remind you of some tan inverse integral. All right, we'll get to there in a little bit, but it should remind you of that. All right, so once we have this, I'm going to come straight down and I'm going to clean it up a bit. That way I can see what's really going on there. Because as it stands, it's not a trigonometric substitution. It's not an inverse substitution or anything like that. But there's this one tricky aspect. What you can do, what you can do here is you can actually use long division. Use long division to break this apart. Or there's this one really nice sneaky trick that we use in math a lot. Here it goes. Whoa. I insert a zero into that numerator. And the reason I insert a zero into that numerator is so that I can manipulate that zero to my advantage. Check this out. Does that look better? Oh, yes, it does. That looks way better because at this point in time, minus 2 times the integral of 1 minus this piece here. And if you were to use long division, you would wind up at this spot right here. So notice I didn't use long division and that's fine. Sometimes this works out great. And it's a nice little trick to kind of keep in your back pocket as you go through the rest of your math courses. All right. Now all I got to do is uh, do some uh, integration. So let's work with that integration then. Minus, uh, that's going to be 2 times, this is just going to be x, minus this last term, 1 divided by x squared plus 1. That is, yep, you guessed it, that's your tan inverse, number 17. Number 17 on that table, again, if we're well versed on that table in using it, then this just becomes tan inverse of x, and there we have it. Then we just get plus c. Distributing everything, again, I'm not going to combine like terms because we don't have any like terms, and that's okay. Minus 2x, and this is going to be plus 2 tangent inverse of x plus c. And there you have it, folks. That is the answer to this integral. Very, very nice. All right. So again, these integration techniques, yes, the integrals get rather long, but they're manageable. And that's what we want. All right. Now, the next one, part D. Let's integrate from negative 1 to 2 for the absolute value of e to the x minus 1 dx. Now, this is going to be a problem from Calc 1. All right, so a problem from Calc 1. Now, when we're looking at this, we have to be careful. The integral that we're looking at if it has an absolute value on the integrand, that means that we can only integrate for any positive y values. Meaning, if we ever see anything graphically that dips below the x-axis into those negative y values, then we cannot integrate that. It has to be only above. Absolute value will then guarantee us that, hey, you can look at it and you can integrate it so long as it's above the x-axis. So we want to make sure that that fits. 
So really quickly, what I want to do is I want to graph this and I want to show you graphically what this looks like. All right, so here's a graph of e to the x minus one. So looking at this graph of e to the x minus one, if we were to integrate without the absolute value from negative one to two, then we would be looking at this area here and it's highlighted on the screen. Now I want you to take a second to then digest what's happening here. If you remember from Calc 1, any area underneath a curve but above the x-axis has a positive area. Any area below the x-axis underneath the curve, or in this case above the curve, has a negative value associated to that area. Which means once we find this area, then this area will automatically subtract out that piece, this piece that's negative. And we want the absolute value to take place. The absolute value of this function is this. Any th values that go below the x-axis then get reflected to be above the x-axis. So we graph it as normal. The only thing different is that we now reflect it to be above the x-axis. So this function here is the absolute function, the absolute value function for f of x, or in this case, the absolute value of e to the x minus one. Now, if we wanna calculate that integral, that integral then is gonna have both positive areas, which means we should be looking at a value close to 4.76. Nice. Now compare that to the other value that we had, which was uh, 4.02. You can see it on the left-hand side of the screen over here, which again, there is a difference. So how do we then interpret this? Well, first things first, we gotta find this intersection here. When does a graph intersect the x-axis? When that graph intersects the x-axis, one of the sides has to then be reflected above the x-axis. All right, so we're gonna go back and we're gonna write that out. Here we go. So as we saw from before, from that graph, that if we go from negative one to zero, and the reason we go to zero is because this is where our initial graph, e to the x minus one, crosses the x-axis. Now, because that side was the side that was reflected, that means that we need to multiply by a negative in order to account for that flip, quote unquote flip, that's gonna take place. Plus, we're gonna go from zero to two for e to the x minus one dx. And all we have to do now is integrate, all right? Well, for this first integral, what we'll do is we'll uh, distribute, so that's gonna be one minus e to the x dx. Uh, this other integral is already quite nice. It'll just be e to the x minus x. Oops, excuse me there. e to the x minus x, and that's evaluated from zero to two. First integral, x minus e to the x, evaluated from negative one to zero. And then now this is going to be plus e squared minus two minus e to the power of zero plus zero. All right, keep working with this. This is now going to be zero minus e to the power of zero. And then we're gonna have the subtraction here. So that's gonna be minus x, but minus x is negative one. So it's gonna be plus one. And then uh, here it's going to be negative and negative, so that's positive e to the power of negative one. And then I still have over here plus, that's e squared minus two minus one. And let's see if we can simplify all this. e to the power of negative one stays as is, that's e to the power of negative one. And then we have e to the power of two. And then we're gonna have one minus two minus one minus oh sorry one minus two minus one all right let's see what that gets us there that should get us oh excuse me nope i have another one here one minus one my apologies here so one minus one cancels out which means we only get negative three there we are 
And there is our final answer. So again, here we didn't really need any substitutions. We just needed that interpretation of what does this function look like when I'm trying to find this integration. All right, so here's a fresh set of examples. We want to work on this first example that says evaluate this integral. All right, so we're gonna go through and we're gonna see what happens with this integral. Right, We're trying to see if we can make some type of substitution, some type of trigonometric integral, uh, some type of rational function, anything like that to our advantage. At this point in time, not a rational function, so we can't use any of those methods. Don't see any trig substitutions, can't use that at this time. Uh, let's see if we can use some sort of either u substitution or by parts. All right, say that if I choose u is equal to one plus e to the x. That means that du would have to be just e to the x dx. Now in this particular case, we're gonna say, okay, well doing the substitution doesn't really help us because again, at the end of the day, we don't see anything that's beneficial to us. And you're completely right, right? There's nothing beneficial here. So. As I'm looking at this, I'm gonna say, you know what, at this point in time, I don't like the way this looks here. Um, and I'm gonna say, doesn't work per se. However, what if I chose a different substitution? What if I chose this? as my substitution, the whole function, square root of one plus e to the power of x. Awesome. Yes, you can see that we could possibly use by parts here to try to break it down, but the initial derivative would be a little bit tough to get around, or the antiderivative. Now, looking at this, yeah, that's tough to take a derivative, so I'm gonna bypass that derivative really quickly, and instead, I'm going to look at this function. Now here, can I take this derivative? Yes, I can, all right? So taking this derivative will get us two u times du, all right, that's a chain rule, plus, uh, or sorry, equals to, this is going to be e to the x dx. Very nice. Now looking at this again, doesn't look that nice, but it gives us a method of approach. All right, what is that method of approach? Well, we'll figure it out right now. All right, so looking at this integral, I have the integral of square root of one plus e to the power of x. Well, that's what we said was u. So that's u, but then we still have this dx. Now this dx, we don't know what this dx is at this point in time, but we do have a method that allows us to solve for that dx. That's this guy right here. So I'm gonna go through and I'm really quickly going to uh, solve for that dx. Would you agree that dx is just two u divided by e to the x du? Nice, I would too. But again, our point, or our goal is to get the left-hand side to be completely in terms of u's and no longer dependent on these x's. So what we can do here is we can use this equation here to say, I know what e to the x is. If we solve for e to the x, we get that e to the x is just u squared minus one, which means my dx has a really nice interpretation, my dx is 2u divided by u squared minus one. Awesome. So coming over here, I'm gonna insert my dx, which I found to be 2u divided by u squared minus one du. Oops. Du, there we are. Integral-wise, we can now go through our integration techniques and say, uh, that's a constant of two, I'm gonna factor that out, so that's a constant of two, and now I'm left with u squared divided by u squared minus one, and that's du. 
<laughs> that looks pretty good. All right, looks pretty good so far. I like it. I like it. All right, here we go. So now this is going to be two. And remember that trick that we did in the previous uh, example where we inserted the zero by adding and subtracting a number? Guess what we're going to do here again? That's exactly right. We're taking the exact same approach. Now, when we take that exact same approach, and that's going to be plus one, u squared minus one, and this is all du. There we go. So now we're looking at this. And this is where we want to be. Because here, this is just going to be 1. Now here, oops, uh, yeah, the integral of 1 plus, plus 1 divided by u squared minus 1 du. Now it's at this point in time that this highlighted portion we're going to need partial fraction decomposition there. So we need partial fraction decomposition here in order to move forward. Partial fraction decomposition. Simply because that is a rational function, D uh, denominator is larger than the numerator degree-wise. So if we use partial fraction decomposition, then we're going to have 1 over u minus 1 times u plus 1. That's the factorization of the denominator. And this is going to be a over u minus 1 plus b over u plus 1. Multiply both sides. And we get a times u plus 1 plus b times u minus 1. All right, we can go through our methods. All right, so let's go through the methods really quick to figure out what this partial, partial fraction decomposition will be. All right, so you can distribute and start combining all of your like terms. So that's going to be a times u plus a plus b times u minus b. All right, I see uh, my variable here is going to be u, so I'm going to have a plus b multiplies u, and whatever's left over goes together. And all this is equal to 1, which means that uh, a plus b must be equal to 0, and a minus b must be equal to 1. All right, so let's figure out those numbers. All right, now you'll be able to see from here uh, a few numbers that automatically work. And I'm just going to say solve here. All right. So, all right, and so those values that work is that A must be 1 half and B must be negative 1 half. Now that we have that partial fraction decomposition, we can go through and we can now insert this. A was that uh, 1 half, so that's 1 half divided by u minus 1 plus negative 1 half divided by u plus 1 according to our partial fraction, and that's all du. All we have to do at this point in time is uh, go through the integration techniques. All right, so each of these becomes just that natural log for the two terms that have the u in the denominator. And this is going to be 2 times, this is going to be u plus 1 half times the natural log of the absolute value of u minus 1 minus 1 half times the natural log of the absolute value of u plus 1. All right, there we are. And then we get a plus c here. Now, at the end of the day, we're not solving for u, so we got to keep that in mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute the 2 while do some back substitution. All right, so let's distribute the 2. So that's going to be 2 times u, but u is no longer u. u was that uh, 1 square root of 1 plus e to the x. All right, distribute the 2. That's just going to be the natural log of the absolute value of the square root of 1 plus e to the x minus 1. Then minus, and then again we have that 
half and half multiplying there, half and two multiplying. Then we get the square root of one plus e to the x uh, plus one. And then we just get a plus c. And there we are. Here is our final result. And some of you have mentioned that uh, whenever we have logarithms, we can't combine them. And you're absolutely correct. As long as we have the same logarithm, we can combine their arguments so long as we have an addition or subtraction between those uh, logarithms. So this then becomes the natural log of square root of 1 plus e to the x minus 1 divided by square root of 1 plus e to the x plus 1. And this is all plus c. There we are. Oops, my apologies. Uh, absolute value. There we go. Perfect. So that is this integral. Again, u substitution looks like it works, uh, but initially if we chose the wrong substitution, then again, we would be in for a, a world of pain. But again, we gotta be versatile and we gotta use different manipulations that we can come across. Awesome. So let's work with part B now. Part B, this integral that I want to evaluate here is going to be the integral from zero to pi fourths dx divided by 1 minus sine of x. Now again, you're trying to look for rational functions, trigonometric substitutions, biparts, uh, u substitutions, anything like that. Anything that you can use at your disposal that would be mathematic mathematically correct. Now, one of the items that I want to see here is that I see this 1 minus sine of x. Because I see 1 minus sine of x, this should kind of remind us remind us of uh, some sort of Pythagorean identity. So it kind of reminds us of a Pythagorean identity, and it should. Um, it's not exactly in Pythagorean identity form, but we can definitely get it there if we choose to multiply by 1 plus sine of x. In other words, we're multiplying by the conjugate here. So if we multiply by the conjugate, then that numerator just becomes 1 plus sine of x, and the denominator here becomes 1 minus sine squared of x, and this is still from 0 to pi fourths dx. The denominator then turns into something nice, and that something nice being cosine squared of x dx. And the reason we want to take this approach, again, is because now we get to work with something a little bit, I would say, cleaner, because now we get this, cosine squared x plus sine of x over cosine squared x. Just making that substitution allows us to make this algebraic manipulation. And once we're able to make this algebraic manipulation, then we can go through and try to finish solving this problem. All right, let's keep going. What does that look like? Well, that here looks like secant squared x. And this piece kind of looks like a tangent. I see a tangent in here, but I also see a secant. So this turns into secant x times tangent of x dx. Nice. Now, because that turns into secant of x times tangent of x, uh, we can go through and we can start evaluating. Now, I want you to pause for a second. Do these integrals look familiar? Zero to pi fourths, secant squared x dx plus zero to pi fourths, secant x times tangent of x dx. 
see if those integrals look somewhat familiar here. So if I can scroll all the way to the top, there we are. Those integrals, do they look familiar? Yeah, they kind of do. I have a secant squared. That secant squared should kind of remind me of that tangent squared, or sorry, that integral for secant squared gets us tangent. And then I see that integral of secant tangent of x kind of gets a secant of x. Which again makes it nice because getting to that point was a little bit tough, but once we got to that point, it turns out that this just turns to be quite a straightforward integration. So this here, the first integral gets us tangent of x, the second integral gets us secant of x, and this is all just evaluated from 0 to pi fourths. We go through the calculation, tangent at pi fourths plus secant at pi fourths minus tangent at 0 minus secant at 0. Tangent of pi fourths, that's just 1. Secant at pi fourths, well, cosine at pi fourths is root 2 over 2, uh, which means that's 1 over root 2, but secant is just the reciprocal, so that's just root 2. Tangent at 0, that's 0. And then secant at 0, that's just 1 over cosine. Cosine at 0 is 1, so that's 1 over 1, which is just 1. 1's cancel, and we're only left with root 2. There's our final result. So again, as you're working through these problems, you got to go through some steps for integration. Make sure that you run through all of your techniques of integration. That way you can feel comfortable with these. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for this section, and I will see you all for the next section.